Clip it right up here. Okay. okay. And then how do I turn it on, or do you turn it on? Good morning, everybody. No matter who you are or where you might find yourself on life's journey, whether you're a believer, a doubter, or a seeker, you are welcome in this sacred space. And as we get uh, looking over our announcements, uh, I want to call your attention today that there is an invitation to us all to join after worship over in Fellowship Hall to help commemorate uh, and uh, uh, as... Um, as um, uh, uh, John would say, some of them should commiserate with Gail on their 50th wedding anniversary, okay? So uh, there is going to be refreshments in there. Uh, and also in the bulletin, I noticed that we have an 80th birthday coming up, uh, and that will be celebrated on August the 18th. So, it just so happens that to help celebrate in that birthday, we're going to invite everybody to go putt-putting, okay? Also, which will start at 3 o'clock at the historic putt, all right? So, make plans for that. And I'm going to turn over the next announcement to Cheryl. I just want to make an update and a clarification for August branching out. It's a little confusing. The church office recently received an urgent plea from Eastridge Pantry for volunteers and food, and we usually don't take things to Eastridge anymore. An email was sent to the congregation about the volunteer opportunities there, and you can help with the food needs this month. There's a list on the big basket in the narthex and a few small shopping lists for you to take if you want 
This will be our branching out for August only, so let's fill the basket to overflowing. However, now and in the future, we are still primarily working with Open Shelf Pantry at Connection Point. However, their immediate needs are a little different. They are in need of personal care items and always toilet paper. These items, these are items they can't buy at the food bank. Specific items are listed on the bulletin board for them. They also gratefully accept food donations, but can buy more at the food bank if we donate our dollars directly to them rather than buy food at the grocery store and then donate it. If you wish to do that in the future, you can just make out a check to Vine with Open Shelf Pantry in the memo line. And Open Shelf also needs volunteers, so if anyone is interested in that, you can see me for information. So lots of ways to help out this month. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. And also, it's uh, with Eastridge, they're also very short on physical help. So if you want to just show up to be able to help bag the, the groceries and or help hand that out, uh, call Eastridge Presbyterian Church and uh, find the right person that you can volunteer with. Uh, are there any other, oh, the rummage sales coming up this week for Camp Kaleo, which is going to be held over at First Christian Church in, here in Lincoln. So if you uh, have any items that you still would like to get rid of, I think, George, you said that's this coming Friday. And Okay. So noon to four and nine to five. And then, of course, the, the sale is next Friday. Itself. Correct. All right. Great. And then uh, I want to make one, one clarification uh, for our worship in the park up at Bethany Park next Sunday. Uh, bringing food items is your ba basic responsibility. But I want to clarify the idea of the offering. Uh, we are having a unified collecting uh, a collection of offering, which is going to go to community crop. And so uh, consider that as a special offering. The regular offerings and tithes that you give to the church, we'll do that here, okay? So, I mean, um, so you can either give ahead this week or uh, behind in two weeks here. But just know that the offering that's going to be taken next Sunday is going to be for community crops here in Lincoln. And uh, your lawn chair and food and yourselves. Those are the three, three things to bring at 1030 up at Bethany Park next Sunday. Any other announcements? All right, well, I'd invite you all to greet each other with the peace of Christ prior to us entering into worship. Okay, I'm going to uh, ask that you all go back into your uh, pew that you started with. And if you would like to join with me on our call to worship. The Holy One is just and merciful, righteous and compassionate, wise and near. <clears throat> We 
We long for your presence and gather before you in gratitude and awe of your steadfast love. Create just righteous and loving hearts within us. Renew our spirits as we declare your praise and seek you in prayer. And I'd invite you to turn to your hymnal to our first hymn, which is found on page 386. The church is one foundation. And please join with me in our invocational prayer. Gracious God, we give thanks for your presence among us. In the chaos of our lives, you provide calm, healing, and sanctuary. Inspire us to be a transformed as you immerse us in your everlasting love, restless pursuit. Your spirit fills the atmosphere as we gather in your name from pew to park and from sanctuary to sofa. Open our to your word and inflame our imagination of all patience 
in your kingdom on earth. May it be so. Amen. You may sit down and I'd invite the children to come forward. No children want to come forward. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. Well, we're going to, to pass that then. And uh, somewhere along the line, we'll do the blessing of the pack backpacks when they get back here. Um, McKin uh, uh, Kinsey, would you like to share with us your music? Zion, that was a nice lead-in for the prayer. Thank you. <laughs> Kinsey, thank you for that beautiful song. I'd invite you all to join with me uh, as we go in a unified prayer of transformation and new life. Shall we pray? Redeemer, forgive us. We confess our complicity with the systems of this world that hurt and harm your children and your creation. We confess our complacency with the status quo, incrementalism, uncertainty is need, and the claim that nothing ever changes. We confess our comfort holds more influence over us than your command that we love our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us and release us from the bonds of guilt and shame so that we can be free to change and grow, free to receive your power and new life, and free to be your agents of transformation in the world. Holy One, in your mercy, Hear our plea. Amen. And let us take a few minutes as we meditate upon the words that we have just lifted up.
redeemed. The Savior God has given you power and freedom to live as full citizens in the kingdom of God. Receive the grace to do your best for today, trusting that the Spirit will guide you in your best for tomorrow. The past has no power to keep you from new life in the present and abundant life in the future. Claim your redemption and ingratitude and new life gifted to you in Christ. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Our scripture reading for today is from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your eyes, I will take your wives, and I will give them to one who is close to you, and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. This is a scripture for today. May we hear the word of God in it for us. I'd invite those who are able to stand to do so as we sing our next hymn, which is found on page 575, O oh, for a World.
may be seated. If I hesitate long enough, it will build the anticipation. <laughs> when is enough not enough? We talk week after week about the abundance of resources that are given by God and how that differs from the messages of scarcity given to us daily as a world view. Wall Street and Fifth Avenue marketing would have us believe that we never have enough and that there is always something more that we need. We are forever being told that we must do what we can to gather more than what is sufficient. In fact, one of Madonna's best-selling songs that I can recall sums up Wall Street's mantra when she says, and when I have it all, all I need is more, more, more. All I need is more. If we honestly believe that God provides enough for us, then at what point do we determine enough is enough? When do we recognize that what we have is sufficient and in faith live into the assurance of sufficiency that God says is around us and is provided? This is the question that this morning's scripture asks us to consider. Today's scripture is a continuation on the life of King David, a man who started from humble roots. He was a forgotten boy who was tending sheep while the prophet Samuel was looking for God's next chosen king. David, who as a young boy leads Israel into victory after he stands up against the giant named Goliath, and kills him. David then becomes the personal aide to King Saul, soothing Saul's mental illness with his harp playing. And eventually, David marries Saul's daughter, Michael, and also becomes the love interest of Saul's uh, son, Jonathan. David becomes the mightiest warrior in Israel, and is eventually crowned king. And he unites all 12 of the Hebrew nations, our tribes, into one nation. It's truly a rags-to-riches story with David. David becomes this idea of what the future Messiah will look like, the one who is a mighty warrior, who dispenses justice and is the protector of Israel. David as king has all that he could possibly want to have, yet it never seemed to be enough for David. He's always wanting more. Hence comes the story of his affair with another man's wife, Bathsheba. We hear God's displeasure of David's abuse of privilege and, and position of power through the words of his trusted prophet Nathan, delivering God's accusation, saying, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hands of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your, your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have given you even more. When we look at people who are successful by our cultural standards, meaning they generally have made lots of money and hold certain positions of power, we often refer to them as self-made individuals. The problem with this, with this type of accolade is this. No one is truly a self-made individual. There is always, and I don't think that I am 
making a generalization in this statement. There is always people helping us to achieve that which we have. Yes, one still needs the focus and energy to achieve one's goals, but no one does it alone. Each of us has had people in our lives helping us along our journey, giving us a step up, so to speak. At one time in our society, there was an expectation that when we have achieved, the expectation is, is that we pay it forward to the next person. The problem with this label of self-made comes too often our forgetting our roots and those who helped us along the way. Often developing blinders on the needs of others and not looking in how we might be able to help others and as a way of protecting our circumstances we start supporting ideas and actions that become restrictive and burdensome to those who are struggling to survive. This was David's lesson to learn in life. He had become so powerful that he had forgotten how his privilege could negatively affect other people. His concern with his own wants blinds his awareness of how his actions hurt other people. He sees a beautiful woman. He wanted her, and as king, he was able to have her. Then, to hide the rape, he orchestrates the murder of her husband, Uriah. And we find no remorse in his actions when we hear the message that he sent off to his commander regarding not only Uriah's death, but the death of other soldiers who died in that process. And the message says, oh, don't worry about the collateral deaths of some of my soldiers in carrying out the murder of Uriah. And I am paraphrasing. Soldiers die all the time in battle. No remorse. It is in this morning's reading that we see how the prophet Nathan skillfully confronts David with his obsession of greed and callousness toward others as he tells the story of the rich man who has many sheep and takes from his poor tenant the only piece of property that he has, that one lone sheep. And this lone sheep represents the means of producing income for this poor tenant. Well, David becomes furious at hearing about the rich man's actions and wants to have him executed and the poor man restored with four times the loss that he suffered at the hands of the rich man. David, you are that man, says Nathan. Then David realizes how awful his actions have been and repents. The problem with wealth and privilege is that those who possess it often do not recognize their abuse of it. There's a scene from an older movie called Our Sons where we see the mother of a young man dying from complications of HIV, confessing her sin of turning her back on her son because he was a homosexual. In her confession to her son, she stated, waste is a terrible thing. But the worst kind of waste happens when you don't realize it as it's happening. Overcoming her fears of contracting AIDS, she reaches out to hold her dying son's hand 
touching him for the first time in 15 years. 15 years of waste. Because she was taught a a theological belief that promoted bigotry and denied room for unconditional love by churches who have abused their power and mission of promoting God's message of reconciliation, the message of mercy, the message of grace. The story of David asks us to personally examine our own privilege and come to terms with the abuses that we have unknowingly done or may currently be doing to others. Privilege and power so easily can blind us in how we view ourselves at the expense of other people. As a nation, our actions affect others in the world. Our wants and our needs affect countries to the south of us, and to the east of us, and to the west of us. So this week, as you're out shopping and contemplating, oh, this is something I think I'd really like to have. Is it something that is needed? Is it a want? If I buy it, who am I denying? If I buy it, Who am I helping? As we interact with other people that we meet, or while we're driving and we feel that we have the right of way on the road, how do our actions affect the other person? You too may find an aha moment as to when enough isn't enough in your life. Amen. The psalmist cries out, O God, how may, uh, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell in your holy hill? God's response was, Those who walk, who walk blamelessly and do what is right, who speak the truth from their heart, and who do not slander with their tongue, who do no evil to their friends, nor take up a reproach against their neighbors. Again, in response, God sent the world as a gift his son Jesus, saying, This is my son of whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And while upon the mountainside, Jesus sat his disciples down and taught them, saying, There is no charge to enter the realm of heaven's kingdom. What delight comes to you when you wait upon the Lord, for you will find comfort. What blessing comes to you when the gentleness lives in you, for you will inherit the earth. And how rich you are when you are, uh, when you crave righteousness, for you will be surrounded with fruitfulness. How satisfied you are when you demonstrate tender mercy. For tender mercy will be demonstrated to you. What bliss you experience when your heart is pure. For then your eyes will open to see more and more of God. How blessed you are when you make peace. For then you will be recognized as a true child of God. How enriched you are when you bear the wounds of being persecuted for doing what is right. For that is when you experience the realm of heaven's kingdom. At this 
point in time, let us open our time of communion with a prayer of lifting up uh, our concerns and our joys that are on our heart. Let us lift up the physical and emotional needs to the one whose power is above all power and whose love exceeds all love. Let us hold Russ Workman as he is in rehab after having a slight stroke earlier this week. Let us pray. Hear Hear our our prayer, prayer, O Lord. Lord. Let us continue to hold in prayer for healing. Christy Turner, Maddie Elbrick, Paula and Russ, Scott Mitchell, Diane Stover, and Dina. Let us pray. Hear Hear our our prayer, prayer, O Lord. I also ask that we uh, send up prayers for safety for people who are currently in the way of the tropical storm, uh, Debbie, and uh, as it continues to reach towards land, let us pray for safety. Hear our prayer, O Lord. What other prayers of concerns or joys do we bring forward? So the joy of a 50-year life together, let us rejoice. Thanks Thanks be to God. Let us then uh, pray the prayer that uh, Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In John 6, Jesus in love tells the crowd, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures, to eter- that leads to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. Jesus goes on to explain that when he had just said, saying, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. The bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And again, the world did not value this message from God. And on the last evening of Jesus' life, he was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver by one of his own, who did not comprehend what Jesus thought taught. During Jesus' last meal with his disciples, he took bread, he blessed it, broke it, and passed it among his disciples.
In the breaking of this bread, Jesus gave us an understanding of his teaching, saying, This bread, which is broken for you, is in truth my body that is broken for your sake. Each time that you gather and eat of it, remember me. At the end of the meal, Jesus took a pitcher of wine and after pouring it into a common cup, blessed it and passed it to his disciples to satisfy their thirst. Of this cup, Jesus said, this fruit of the vine represents new life, and in the shedding of my blood, there too comes the true new life. When you drink it, remember the new life that comes to you. Let us close this time of communion and prayer. We give thanks, loving God, that you have refreshed us at your table of grace and mercy. 
Let this time be a time of renewal and strengthening of our faith. Let this meal encourage us to continue reaching out to one another in acts of love, grace, and mercy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. The gifts of God uh, blesses us and invites, and the invitation of God is to share those blessings with generosity, gratitude, trust, and love. Let us give of our time, talent, and treasure for the abundance of God's provisions to us. I'd invite those who are able to stand to do so and to turn on page 776 for our sung uh, responsive blessing of the offering. Our sending forth song is found on page 79. May the sending one defend you.
go in the assurance that you are redeemed. Go with compassion, courage, and conviction that a beloved community is possible and waits on your participation. Go in peace and hope, knowing that God is with us. Amen. <laughs>